Welcome to the M1 Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Marcus Sadu, and today we are going to be chatting about the difference between what and how much we think that we eat and what and how much we actually eat. Now, we are not wired to remember or take really close account of what and how much we eat for a few reasons. One is, our bodies do it for us via sensations like hunger, satiation, and body fat levels, for example. Secondly, for the vast majority of our evolutionary history as humans, food has been far more scarce than it is today, and therefore, starving was a much higher risk to our well-being than overeating was. And therefore, only since food has become so abundant has overeating even been a possibility to a large degree, meaning we're not wired to worry about overeating in the slightest, but we are wired to be concerned about undereating because that most certainly means death via starvation. And third, in order to remember anything, we have to rely on our memories. And everyone is aware that memory is finite. You cannot possibly remember even close to everything that takes place over the course of your lifetime, a year, a month, a day, often even an hour, things will slip through the cracks. And you can think about your memory like storage on a computer that's constantly filtering out the least important information in order to keep at least some space free for potentially more important info. Our memories are also ambitious, meaning we prioritize and remember things that reinforce ideas and concepts that we believe or want to believe about ourselves to be true. So for example, if I believe I'm a nice person, it's more likely that I'm going to remember acts of kindness that I carry out over actions that I took that weren't so kind. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, it's just the way that our flawed memories and sense of self work. When it comes to food, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard the phrase, I eat really healthy, but I can't seem to lose weight. It is entirely possible to eat healthful foods and just eat too much of them to a point where it inhibits fat loss. However, most folks that are having a hard time losing weight are falling for the ambitious or favorable memory trap because being that their goal is fat loss, they tend to focus or remember the healthful meals that they eat and they tend to overlook and conveniently not remember the not so healthful meals, snacks and treats that they take in. In my nutritional coaching questionnaire that I send out to potential clients, I have a question that asks, what are you eating now? Give me an example of a regular day. And it's quite often that I'll see an example like this. Oatmeal for breakfast, a salad at lunch, and a protein with some potatoes, rice, or some other starch at dinner. And then maybe at the end, they'll mention some snacks like crackers, hummus, cheese, nuts, etc. Now, if this was a really accurate picture of how this individual was eating on a regular basis, they likely wouldn't have even reached out to me because they're eating so healthfully and keeping their portions in check according to their example of a regular day that they wouldn't actually need my help. Now, don't get me wrong. Some folks are super transparent and aware of their eating habits right out of the gate, and I love it because it just means that they have less attachment and meaning around food, which brings up another aspect and a big one at that around why we have trouble accounting for what and how much we eat. There tends to be a bunch of embarrassment and shame tied up in food. And this is a recent phenomenon, again, because food is so much more abundant now and being overweight really hasn't been a thing for all that long in our evolutionary history. And therefore, we've now projected all sorts of funky ideas onto food that we never did in the past. Hunter-gatherers have been studied extensively and have been seen to eat massive quantities of food at once. I'm talking five pounds of meat, 30 oranges. They'll literally guzzle honey by the liter, pure honey. Now, we are opportunistic eaters due to how we evolved in relation to food access. And so we've got a get it while it's hot sort of mentality. It's quite literally a survival mechanism because if you come across a ripe orange tree with hundreds of oranges on it and you only eat two or three because, you know, everything in moderation, right? Well, you just screwed yourself because when you wake up the next morning, that tree is going to be stripped bare by some other animal. So you either get it in you now or you don't get it at all. We still have this get it while it's hot proclivity, but food is abundant now and no one is raiding your fridge or pantry while you sleep at night. And so we label ourselves gluttons if we overeat food that's so easily accessible and calorie dense, 
even though it's literally how we were designed to interact with it. The number one priority of any animal is to get their genes as far into the future as possible. And how do we do that? First of all, we ideally don't die, right? Starvation is a threat to life. So essentially, we consume calories, we have sex, and we have babies. Put that on repeat, and that's how genes are passed on. Calories turn into babies. But now we've got more than enough calories than we need and dying of overconsumption of food is actually a higher risk than dying of food scarcity in most of the world at this point. So we've got this evolutionary mismatch where we've got these tendencies to eat as much as possible while we can, but a food abundant environment. So our human software hasn't been updated to our new and current situation because evolution takes time. Hence, we've attached all sorts of shame, disappointment, I'm lazy, I'm this, I'm that sort of messaging around overconsuming food. And yet it's exactly what we're designed to do. That's literally the whole point of body fat. That's why it exists. It is stored fuel for future famine. That may have seemed like an off topic tangent, but it ties in with why we misreport, misremember, and just all around pretty bad at accurately accounting for what and how much we eat because we're designed for this food scarce environment, not a food abundant environment. And being that that is the case, now there are a bunch of quote unquote negative emotions, thoughts, and ideas tied to over consuming food, even though that consumption pattern is written into our DNA. Feeling shameful for wanting to eat all sorts of super tasty calorie dense foods. It's like beating yourself up for wanting to breathe when someone is choking you or feeling the urge to want to have sex with someone you find attractive. These are bucketed in the survival and pass on your genes category, meaning you are hardwired for them. It turns out this program actually has a name and it's called optimal foraging theory or optimal foraging strategy. And there's even an equation for it. Animals want to obtain as many calories as possible while expending the least amount of effort, energy, in the least amount of time. So for example, if an animal has access to a thousand calories and they can either choose to walk one mile or five miles to obtain it, which one do you think they're going to choose? Of course, one mile. And we are animals. We have this same tendency because again, if we circle back to our evolutionary history, we evolved in a food scarce environment and therefore it was very important that we didn't burn more calories than we needed to burn because too many calories burned equates to more likelihood of starvation. So going one mile for a thousand calories is quicker and it burns less energy, meaning we end up with a larger amount of calories, quote unquote, kept because walking 10 miles will burn 10 times as many calories as walking one mile. So given this information, there's no need for shame or to make yourself wrong for either wanting to consume all the pizza, pasta, and ice cream, because that's just your physiology increasing your likelihood for survival. That's really it. Now that we've got this framework for why it's so easy to misreport and misremember our intake, as well as why we have these urges to eat all the food all the time, what do we do about it? First of all, as I've talked about many times, the only way to gain weight is to eat more calories than you're burning, and the only way to lose weight is to eat fewer calories than you're burning. So right out of the gate, it's important to acknowledge that if you are gaining weight, you are in a calorie surplus. No matter what you think about how much you're eating, no matter how you feel about how much you're eating, your body is the ultimate barometer. On the other hand, if you're losing weight, you're in a calorie deficit. Simple as that. Now let's say that you feel like you're not eating very much at all and you should be losing weight, but you're not. The absolute best way to move forward effectively is to implement a food diary. Record everything that goes into your mouth in the notes on your phone, along with the portions, and that means food, drinks, alcohol, sauces, anything with calories in it. Is this tedious? Yes. Does it require effort and awareness? Yes. But what's the alternative, right? You want the result at the end of this. We've already established that your body is the ultimate barometer. So if you're not losing weight, but you think that you should be, there's a leak in the system somewhere and we need to identify it. Now, a few super important things in regards to implementing a food diary. 
Be sure to record everything that you eat when you eat it. Do not wait until the end of the day or even worse yet, the end of the week because you will 100% forget things. I can barely remember what I ate yesterday, let alone two days ago. And if I was to try and remember the portions, forget it, right? There's no way I could put a food diary together with any sort of accuracy unless I stay on top of it and record everything in real time. The most important thing with your food diary is that it be accurate, not that it look good. Meaning, it doesn't matter if you eat pizza 10 times over the course of the week, as long as you record it and account for it. Because the whole point of the food diary is to provide yourself with accurate information that you can assess, implement change where need be, and then make progress. So no matter how guilty, how embarrassed, how disappointed, insert whatever word you feel if you eat something that you don't feel great about eating, record it. You can think about it like assessing your budget. You can totally fudge the numbers and make it look like you're saving more money than you are, but like, what the fuck is the point in that? Aren't you wanting to improve your financial stability? Is that not the goal of a budget to begin with? The truth is, if you're not recording things and you find yourself saying, oh, it's just a couple scoops of peanut butter, the odd glass of wine, a few bites of cake, and a super small bowl of ice cream, stop and just remind yourself again, what outcome am I after? Am I more interested in avoiding the feelings of, say, embarrassment, disappointment, shame, etc., by not recording these things? Or do I want to be super honest with myself where I'm at and then move forward and make better progress as a result? Because who are you really screwing by not being honest with yourself? You're literally dropping a hammer on your own toe. So record everything and be willing to feel whatever you feel because that is the key driver that slips people up when it comes to food diaries and getting super honest with themselves about what and how much they're truly eating. And again, there's no need for shame here. I'm speaking from personal experience. I've eaten plenty of ice cream, peanut M&Ms, and pizza too. It always feels great going down, but getting super honest with yourself and why you're truly not getting the results that you're after is the whole reason why you're implementing the food diary to begin with. A few more quick things to look out for. Something that I really drive home with clients is that things that seem small and trivial at the time often add up and equate to a real difference over the course of days, weeks, and months. So for example, handfuls of nuts when you walk by the pantry, finishing off your kids' plates, an extra scoop of peanut butter every time you open the jar, a few beers, cooking oils, butters and sauces, a handful of crackers, a slices of cheese, like all this stuff adds up and you can think about it like coffee. If you go for a coffee every day and let's say it's five bucks, what's five bucks, right? Who cares? Well, over the course of a week, that's $35. Over the course of the month, that's $140. And over the course of a year, that turns into $1,680 that you spent on coffee. That's a vacation. So seemingly little things turn into big things when compounded over the course of time. Now, as far as how long to implement a food diary for, I would recommend an absolute minimum of 14 days, just so you can get an accurate picture of your intake over time. And you really want to include at least two weekends because that's where folks really tend to fall off. One cool byproduct that you might notice if you take this food diary thing to heart is you're probably going to lose weight just by implementing the food diary itself, even if you've been stuck for quite some time, because this exercise is going to bring far more awareness to your daily intake. And therefore, by default, you're going to make better food decisions and probably skip that extra dessert, glass of wine, etc. And this is just a super cool added benefit of doing a food diary itself. It's really amazing for becoming more aware and eliminating mindless eating too and just getting super honest with yourself. I think that's the biggest payoff and the reason that I say that is because it's really empowering. When you feel like you should be getting a result that you're not, taking full responsibility and accountability, leaving no stone unturned and just diving headfirst and discovering where those leaks are in your calorie intake, man, your results are right on the other side of that. Also, I'd recommend looking at your intake as information, not what it says about you morally as a human. Because remember, we're wired for a food scarce environment. So definitely set yourself up for success in regards to your food environment at home, i.e. keeping plenty of food around that you want to eat and ditching the stuff that goes contrary to your goals. 
But if you slip up here and there, record it, put it in the accurate information category and move on because this information is only supporting your progress long term, being that the better your information is, the more effectively you can move forward and ultimately achieve your fat loss goals. If you're interested in applying for one-on-one nutritional coaching and or workout design with me, you can click the link in the description below or head on over to n1fitness.com forward slash coaching. Follow me up on Instagram at n1fitness and feel free to friend me on Facebook at Marcus Sidhu. And lastly, be sure to hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using. Thanks so much for tuning in and I will catch you on the next episode. See ya.